Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Walker, and I'm director of the School of Policy Studies at Queen's. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to uh, welcome you here tonight. We have a special guest speaker to honor the Sinclair Lecture, who will be introduced in a minute by Dr. Chris Simpson. I would like to say a few words about the Sinclair Lecture. Many of you will know Duncan Sinclair. He's very sorry he can't be here tonight. He's uh, taking a small holiday enjoying Canada's healthcare system and uh, will be better soon. But he has sent his uh, son Duncan in his place, of whom he's very proud because Duncan always would say, he's not a famous person, but his son Gord Sinclair is a member of the Tragically Hip and therefore the, the very popular person in the family. The Sinclair Lecture was endowed by Duncan and Leona and by the Medical Research Council of Canada to advance thought in public policy as it relates to our healthcare system. And over the years, many distinguished speakers have, have spoken at Queen's and talked about matters of importance in social policy as it relates to health. So this particular lecture tonight by the Honorable Jane Philpott fits very nicely into that mantra. And I know Duncan is very sorry that he could not be here, but uh, this will fulfill the criteria for the Sinclair Lecture most, most wonderfully. So Duncan is here in spirit, Gord is here in person, and I will ask Chris Simpson to introduce our special guest. Well, thank you, David. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, all here today to Queen's University and to this beautiful venue, and to welcome and introduce this year's Duncan G. Sinclair Lecturer in Health Policy, Canada's Health Minister, Dr. Jane Philpott. Now, many of you may know that Minister Philpott is an avid Twitter enthusiast, so please feel free to tweet along using the hashtag Queen's Sinclair. And I'd be pretty confident that the minister might even retweet some of you on her way home tonight. Uh, Dr. Jane Philpott is the Member of Parliament for Markham Stoffel, uh, having been elected in the 2015 general federal election. She was subsequently appointed to Cabinet as Canada's Minister of Health. Prior to her political career, she worked as a family physician at Markham Stoffel Hospital for more than 15 years, serving as Chief of the Department of Family Medicine from 2008 to 2014. She's an Associate Professor in the University of Toronto's Department of Family and Community Medicine. Uh, she led the opening of the Health for All Family Health Team, a new primary care home for 10,000 patients in the Markham Stoffel community. She also led the opening of the Markham Family Medicine Teaching Unit that has trained over 45 new family physicians in the community since 2010. She studied medicine at the University of Western Ontario, completed a family medicine residency at the University of Ottawa, and a tropical medicine fellowship in Toronto. And then in 2012, she completed a Master of Public Health degree at the University of Toronto. She's worked in Niger Republic in West Africa from 1989 to 1998, uh, where she practiced general medicine and helped to develop a training program for village health workers. In 2004, she founded Give a Day to World AIDS, which has raised over $4 million to help those affected by HIV and AIDS in Africa. She was the first family medicine lead for the Toronto Addis Ababa Academic Collaboration, uh, where she was instrumental in helping Addis Ababa University develop Ethiopia's first training program for family medicine. Now, of course, any of these accomplishments would uh, qualify Dr. Philpott as an excellent Sinclair lecturer. And she's been honored with many academic and community awards for her leadership and vision and humanitarianism. But Minister Philpott has hit the ground running since her appointment to Cabinet, helping to lead the passing of legislation on medical assistance in dying or made, uh, swiftly and deftly addressing the academic community's deep concerns with changes at CIHR, and now, of course, the marijuana file. Another upcoming issue is the new health accord, with nothing less than the future of the federal role in healthcare at stake. So we really have two lecturers this year. We have Dr. Philpott, and we have Minister Philpott. And I know that each of her roles informs and strengthens the other. When our roles were somewhat different, when I was seeking her vote as I ran for president of the Canadian Medical Association, she asked me a lot of very tough 
and important questions. And from this, I know that she is sincere and principled and passionate about health equity and the social determinants of health and has brought great authenticity to her new very important role. So, Minister, it gives me a pleasure to welcome you to Kingston and to Queen's University as this year's Sinclair Lecturer. We'll look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you very much, Chris, for that kind introduction. I uh, just arrived, uh, having hit the road as soon as question period finished in Ottawa and rushing down here. I was a little bit thirsty and someone kindly brought me a bottle of water, which I popped open and just spilled all over myself. So that helped to, I, I feel very relaxed now that I've doused myself in, <laughs> in Kingston water. Um, thank you for your uh, kind words of introduction. Actually, there's a little known fact in my bio that I wondered if anybody would pick up on. And as you were uh, stating it there, I realized that it's, it's not that well known. But in fact, I think if I'm not mistaken, I still have a faculty appointment at the faculty of medicine at Queen's, which is not well known. I think I got the faculty appointment when I was teaching uh, medical students and residents uh, when I was doing my work in Markham, and I don't think they've taken me off the roster yet, and maybe next time I have to fill out an update to my uh, teaching, I'll be able to say that I gave the Duncan Sinclair lecture, and they might, might keep me on their list. Anyway, a real delight to be here. Thank you. What a great honor to be asked to give this lecture, and uh, it's, a, it's a treat to be with you. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Mark Gerritsen, who's a member of Parliament for Kingston and he drove down with us from Ottawa so great to have him here and I don't know where Gord is there you are Gord so uh, sad that your dad was not able to be with us today I know uh, he would have loved to be here but a uh, real honor to have you in the audience so thank you for representing him and uh, I hope I will do him uh, do him proud and and speak on topics that would be of great interest to him um, you know First of all, I do want to say before I go any further to acknowledge that this is uh, that we are situated here in this absolutely stunning theater with fantastic acoustics, and it's on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee territory. So I'm um, very pleased to be able to be welcomed to these uh, lands. And of course, an honor to be able to speak uh, in this event that's named for Dr. Duncan Sinclair, who is well known, I suspect, to so many of you in the audience and has played such an instrumental role in health policy. Of course, uh, having been Dean of Medicine here at Queen's and his very important role in the Ontario Health Services Restructuring Committee, so many other contributions, I'm sure you could list many of them, but has been a real icon, I think, in the Canadian healthcare reform discussion, which has taken place over a number of decades, and I suspect he has some scars to prove it. I wanted to maybe compare some battle scars with him tonight, uh, but I know he's a treasure here in Kingston and Queens, and, um, and it's great to be able to be here. I wanted to congratulate him. I understand he's now actually uh, been appointed to the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame, which is uh, no small feat. So. I thank also Queen's University for hosting this annual event. These kinds of topics are so important and I'm, I'm pleased to see that you're continuing the tradition. I did go to medical school well down the highway, down the 401 at Western, uh, and so I, I, my roots are there as, far as, it, as medical schools go, but I know uh, very much about the respect uh, and the reputation that Queen's has uh, in so many areas, including medicine and social policy and other, other uh, areas of public administration. So it's a, an honor to speak on health care in Canada, a topic that obviously was, uh, it continues to be near and dear to Dr. Sinclair. I looked up some of the things that he said about that over the last number of years, and one of the things that I think is quite interesting, which I've uh, been following up on myself, is that he describes the fact that we don't actually have a health care system here in Canada. He talks about the fact that we have at least 14 so-called systems, uh, one for each province and territory and one for the federal government. And in fact, what we have doesn't fit any uh, actual definition of a system because the moving parts of what people sometimes call the Canadian healthcare system are so poorly coordinated. He's also pointed out that so much of what we talk about and refer to as health care is not truly health care, uh, but is in fact illness care or injury care. And uh, that's one of the little idiosyncrasies that we share, of course, with other jurisdictions as well. 
His perspective, I think, has been built on looking and studying uh, all of the successes and failures that we've had in Canada, but more importantly, that he has spent so much time looking at how we can get beyond uh, the failures, how we can even move beyond the successes and actually improve those multiple systems in this country. So as Chris pointed out, as I, as I speak to you today, I'm speaking um, as well from my own reflections that I have to draw upon, uh, grounded in more than 30 years of being a medical doctor, most of which has been spent here in Ontario, but I did spend, as Chris mentioned, the first decade of my medical career working in Niger Republic, West Africa. So I find myself now in this position, which I, you know, some of you that are in health policy here may see as a, as a health policy maker's dream to actually get to be federal minister of health. And it's pretty amazing because it's not actually one of those jobs where you can career plan and be able to expect that if you take these uh, certain number of steps that you can actually get there. So I acknowledge what a huge privilege it is, uh, but also of course a daunting responsibility to find myself in this role. So I want to talk about some of the things that I've learned about healthcare in Canada over the last three decades, but also focus on where we ought to go from here. And I look forward to hearing your feedback on some of those things. Uh, how many in the room are doctors or medical students? Quite a number, okay. So I suspect that my motivations about becoming a doctor were somewhat similar to yours. I was my desire to help people to have a happy and healthy and meaningful life. But I quickly learned, as I suspect some of you have, that it takes a lot more than medicine to achieve those goals. And in part, I often say when people ask me why I went into politics, it's because of the fact that I felt like I, there was only I could only go so far as a doctor and I bumped up against the edges of, of how much I could help people to enjoy uh, a happy, healthy and meaningful life. And so Chris referred earlier to the social determinants of health, which is really more along the line of policymakers, although I must say many doctors are quite excellent advocates for social determinants of health as well. But I don't need to tell those of you in the room that of course it takes things like a great education and a good job. and and high quality housing and clean water and a clean environment and accessible social services and all of those things in addition to health care in order for people to be healthy. Our government, you may have heard, talks a lot about a strong middle class and those striving hard to join the middle class. That's what our government ran on. But in fact, a strong middle class and, and societies that have a thriving middle class, they don't happen by accident. It takes good public policy. And many of you who are policy experts in the room know that it takes robust social policy and economic policy, but of course it also takes smart health policy. And that's going to be our focus for today. So I want to start by thinking back a little bit um, to a day when things weren't the way that they are, to a period in our history when in fact it wasn't actually that unusual for families to go into debt and sometimes deeply into debt to pay for medical care. A few years ago, the Ontario Coalition of Seniors Organizations produced a book called Life Before Medicare. And I think it's an illustrative book. It's a collection of stories of people who lived in Canada before the introduction of hospital and medical insurance. Which seems like a long time ago, but it was actually, uh, in fact, uh, I was born in the days that, uh, that health, hospital and medical insurance were not seen across the country. And if you need a primer on, on why we need a strong health care system, I would certainly encourage you to read this book. I want to give you a little bit of a snippet from that book, uh, one of the stories. It's interesting, this story actually comes, is based from a place in Ontario where my own parents grew up. It's written by uh, John Hallman, and he wrote about something that happened to his grandfather. And here's what he said, and I quote, He was removed from the accident site and taken to their home in Listowel, Ontario. This is uh, John's grandfather. The doctor was summoned. The dining room was eventually turned into an operating theater, something I've experienced myself in West Africa. Uh, excess fluid pressure in the skull had to be relieved. My dad's mother's assignment was the cloth boiling needs. My, da my dad's himself was to hold the light. I recall my dad saying that the doctor said to him words to the effect, this isn't going to be pleasant. Do you think you can do the job? Once I start, I have to have the light until I'm done. The doctor then proceeded to hand drill through the skull in an attempt to remove excess fluid and re relieve pressure. 
The operation turned out to be unsuccessful and his dad died some days later, not regaining consciousness from the time of the accident. I continue quoting, why wasn't he taken from the hospital? Maybe there was none very close. Maybe the family couldn't afford it. Maybe the doctor felt that the remedy could be done just as effectively at home as a hospital at less cost. John wrote, it's hard for me to believe to be an attendant at an operation performed in my own home on a close family member at the age of 15 or 16 and then to see it all for naught anyhow, end quote. This may seem so long ago, but in fact this took place in Canada around the time that I was born, where unless you were well off or had private insurance, you either relied on charity or you went without. In Canada today, we're in a country where Canadians, when they visit a doctor's office or a hospital, they are treated on the basis of their medical need and the priority of that need and not on the basis of their ability to pay. And so, as Canada's Minister of Health, I am not going to make apologies for supporting a continued commitment that if Canadians pay for their health services through their tax dollars, I don't believe that they should be asked to pay for them again when they access service in the form of user fees, for example. And I believe there's a, an, a resolute international consensus as well on this, that user fees and other fees like them are a barrier to the accessibility of health care. They're not fair, they're bad medicine, and they're bad policy. So let's talk a little bit more about our healthcare systems. I think that we have a tendency to focus more on cure givers than caregivers, particularly to focus on high-priced institutional and specialist care. Now it's true that we do have health systems in this country that provide excellent hospital and medical care, some of them right here in Kingston, and I have to say on many areas, Kingston is absolutely leading the way in patient-centered care, for example, is one of the areas that I've noticed. And throughout this country, we have that kind of excellent care. It's on a universal first dollar coverage basis. We have in Canada some of the very best trained health professionals in the world, and many of our healthcare institutions uh, are recognized as leaders in research, in training, and in specialized care. But 50 years ago, Emmett Hall and others envisioned even better than what we have now. They saw a nationwide adoption of public health insurance, and in a report written by Emmett Hall and others, they went further recommending coverage for dental care, for prescription glasses, for pharmacare. Justice Hall, in fact, wrote in his report that the only thing that's more expensive than good health care is no health care. For a variety of reasons, we never got there in Canada. We never fulfilled those dreams of, of 50 years ago. By the time the last province adopted universal insurance for medical care, it was 1972. Canada was on the verge of hyperinflation, high unemployment, slow growth. That led to belt tightening at the provincial and territorial level as well as the federal level. After that, wrenching debates on national unity would follow as a country, and so further reforms of our health system and the federal role in it were moved to the back burner. Healthcare delivery has changed a lot over the decades that separate us from Hall's Royal Commission on Health Services. Forty years ago, for example, 60% of Canada's health spending went to hospitals and doctors. Today, it's down to 45%. And at the same time, there's been a growing demand for prescription drugs, for long-term care, for home care, for mental health needs. All of these continue to grow. It's no surprise, our populations are aging, people are living longer, chronic diseases are on the rise, there are tremendous technological advances that shift the focus of healthcare delivery away from institutions and more into the home and community. And so most of healthcare funding still goes to hospital and physician services, while all of those other services that have become a part of our healthcare landscape make do with literally a patchwork of limited public funding, private insurance, and out-of-pocket payments. And so most health policy experts would agree we are in fact way overdue for this conversation, a conversation around reform in this country for health systems. 
And I believe that if we're going to have that conversation, the federal government needs to be a player. In fact, one of the arguments that I make when people seem puzzled by the federal government being interested in health is that there has never been a major development in the history of health care in this country where the federal government did not play a critical role. So that brings us to a very interesting time in our modern context where we're having a discussion around a new health accord with provinces and territories. Unfortunately, much of that conversation, especially if you follow the conversation in the media, it often revolves around how much we should spend on health care rather than how and by what mechanisms should we improve health and health care for Canadians. I'm very proud to be part of a federal government that believes that we do have a leadership role on health, of course in collaboration with the provinces and territories. I believe that, in fact, the provincial territorial health ministers also have a strong will to collaborate and have demonstrated that thus far. We have agreed, for example, on shared priorities for health, and some of those include things like home care, palliative care, pharmaceuticals, mental health, innovation, and better health care for Indigenous Canadians. If you haven't already heard, I'm actually planning to meet again next month in Toronto with the pr provincial and territorial health ministers from across the country. I have every, every reason to believe that those will be productive conversations contributing toward the ultimate achievement of a new health accord. So let's look at some of the components that I think need to go into that. One of the challenges is around home and community-based care. And this is something that uh, some of the experts in Queen's have written about. It happens that instead of systems that by default keep patients out of hospital beds, imagine what it would be like if we actually had a new normal where when it's in the patient's best interest, they are effectively cared for at home. On any given day, you may be aware that some 15% of hospital beds are occupied by patients who might actually be better off in another place, perhaps at home, perhaps in a long-term care or supportive housing situation. This has a huge financial impact. For example, in Ontario, basic home care can cost as little as $42 a day compared to a minimum of $840 a day in a hospital. And of course, even though the quality of life and death uh, would be vastly improved if people were in home or sometimes in hospice, for example, surrounded by their friends and family, most Canadians continue to live their final days in hospital. In fact, that's actually where six out of every 10 Canadians dies. This is not by design. We didn't plan it this way. The reality is, though, that patients end up in hospital beds because home care and the supports and services that wrap around that are inadequate and they're poorly coordinated. That's no reflection on the people that deliver those services. It's the reality on the system that's occurred. In Canada, we spend about $10 billion annually, or about 5% of total health spending on home and community care. Sounds like a lot of money, $10 billion, but it's probably not enough, especially since the population is aging, we're burdened by increasing rates of chronic diseases, where patients are delivering care at home. Imagine if we could truly advance towards systems that support family and caregivers so that they don't burn out and so that hospital doesn't become the default option. We need to expand home care supports more broadly and we need to also find improvements particularly in the area of palliative and end-of-life care. And many of you were involved, as was mentioned in, in the introduction, around the conversations that we had on new legislation towards medical assistance in dying. As we've had those conversations, we have emphasized the fact that we have to improve palliative and end-of-life care options outside of acute care settings. This is a golden opportunity where we can actually work together, get all stakeholders at the table, and place a robust system of services and supports that will help address the gaps that so many of you uh, can identify. We, as a federal government, want to collaborate with provinces and territories. We want uh, to invest as they develop the infrastructure to support home care and integrate it seamlessly with the rest of the circle of care. That means helping to uh, support innovative delivery models like telehome care, for example, where providers monitor their patient's health st status remotely and offer education and health coaching. 
It also means supporting innovative funding models, bundling together budgets for home care and acute care, and making sure that the right care is provided in the most cost-effective setting. Taken together, these actions could fill critical gaps. They could lead to stronger home care. I personally believe that home care needs to most often be rooted in primary care, but certainly it needs to be integrated with other health and social services better supported by technology. What else do you think we, should, we will talk about in the health court, accord? Well, one of them that I've mentioned is the need to make sure that prescription medications in this country are affordable, accessible, and appropriately prescribed. We need systems where those, will be, those prescription medications will be available for every Canadian. Health Canada, you may be aware, is responsible for reviewing new drugs to make sure that they are safe and that they work as intended. It's an area where the federal government actually plays a very critical role. But there's a lot of room for improvement. The review process for drugs in this country is indifferent to whether the new drugs that are being reviewed are any better than what's already on the market. So the result is that many of the new therapies introduced each year offer sometimes little benefit over what's currently available, but often come at significantly greater cost. And so to assess the cost effectiveness of new uh, drugs, the federal, provincial and territorial, territorial governments have actually created something called the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, or CADETH. CADETH's job is to conduct cost effectiveness reviews of new therapies through a mechanism called the Common Drug Review, which some of you I acknowledge are probably very familiar with. Um, and then the advice that's crucial to provinces and territories to decide which drugs to cover on their public f formularies comes from that common drug review. One of the problems is the fact that unfortunately there's often a gap of as much as six months between when Health Canada approves a drug to be safe, safe and effective and when the review actually advises about whether it's cost effective. In the meantime, and the, the uh, providers in the room will know this, virtually every private drug plan in the country has listed the new drug on its formulary, patients have come to demand it, and providing, uh, providing it, it is provided under pub, private plans for reimbursement even if the cost effectiveness data is lacking. So we need to explore new ways to focus our regulatory system upon the review of drugs that actually deliver a better standard of care and increase value for money. We also need to re-examine the role of the regulatory body whose job it is to protect Canadians from excessive brand name drug prices. And this, some of you may know, is called the Patented Medicines Prices Review Board. It is uh, required to use as its benchmark in deciding what price point to set uh, it, 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 they, it chooses its benchmark by comparing our prices against some of the highest cost drug manufacturing jurisdictions in the world, including the United States. So, it may come as no surprise that prices for brand name drugs in Canada end up being among the highest in the world. In fact, we're third highest in the world, only barely. Um, the United States is far ahead of us and we are just behind Germany for the highest cost prescription drugs in the world. So we need to bring together our fragmented market for drug coverage, uh, which not only sees Canadians falling through the cracks, as I've discussed earlier, but also imposes these incredibly high costs on businesses. I'm looking forward to exploring with the provinces and territories ways that we can do all of these, in addition to, of course, continuing to advance uh, the work of joint price negotiation through the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance. And we're hopefully going to have some discussions about the possibility of bringing private insurance plans into that. One more item that I'm pushing for within our, our uh, basket of things that we can do in terms of prescription drug prices is to push for a national drug formulary. Um, we believe, and I've, we've had good discussions about this to date, that a common national drug formulary for publicly funded plans would make it easier again to leverage the buying power that provinces and territories and the federal government need to have when we're negotiating with pharmaceutical companies and make it harder uh, for them to play off one, one uh, province against another. Lots more interesting things to discuss about prescription drugs, but let me move on to a third area that will be part of the Accord discussions, and that is, is mental health. The, the founders of Medicare, the designers of the system that we know today, rightly believe that healthcare functions best when it responds to the needs of, it, of Canadian citizens. 
But with it, when you look at Canadians, and I know uh, that you are all aware of the pressures that Canadians face, I think there are a few things that preoccupy Canadians as much or distress them as much within the health of their families as lack of access to good mental health care. Imagine what it could be like if we had systems that made it easier for Canadians to get the help that they need when they have mental distress, when people are contemplating suicide, no matter where they live in this country. The data will tell you that one in five Canadians is affected by mental illness. I actually reject that data. I think every Canadian in this country is affected by mental illness. Every Canadian is, is, is impacted either directly or indirectly, and the statistics on this are staggering. You may know that the Conference Board of Canada, for instance, has said that depression and anxiety cost the Canadian economy $50 billion per year in lost productivity. And if you talk to CEOs of any large company in Canada, they will tell you that mental illness is a huge, uh, huge issue for them. Suicide accounts for one quarter of all deaths among 15 to 24 year olds. And almost half of those who are suffering from depression and anxiety in this, in this country have not seen their doctor about it. But it's not just numbers when, you, when we talk about mental illness. These are human beings. They're your family members, they're your friends, they're your colleagues, people whose lives are swept up even as we speak in chaos and confusion and pain. And probably the statistics include many of you. For too long, mental illness is something that's been hidden, something people have been ashamed of. Today we're talking about it somewhat more openly in our families and in some communities, but not all, and that's a good thing. But as that full extent of the burden of mental illness in Canada becomes clear, and I suspect we have not nearly yet exposed what, how great that burden is, it's obvious that our systems are not well equipped. They're not equipped to heal the traumas that's caused by mental illness. And so, yes, there are places in this country, there are centers of excellence, there's responsive and supportive care, and I suspect some of you in the room are delivering that care, but there are places in this country where men mental health services are almost non-existent and at best fragmented. Many make do uh, with what they have, Doctors and other frontline health workers do their best, but often have not had adequate training. Patients with severe mental illness face incredibly long lists for access to specialists. People who require counseling and therapy and don't need a doctor will have to wait. Uh, if they have private coverage, they may be able to eventually see a provider. Many have to pay out of pocket, but more often than not, people manage without or try to. The problem is, of course, most acute in rural and remote areas, including Indigenous communities, where healthcare system resources are weak, but this happens even in cities of, in Canada. I am convinced that it is not too late to build systems where mental health services are widely available and supportive, regardless of whether you're living in downtown Kingston or northern Canada. Which brings me to a fourth area that will be part of the Accord discussions. We need to renew and reconcile with Indigenous peoples in this country. All of the challenges that I've outlined to date are magnified many times over for Indigenous peoples. And I don't need to tell you about the shocking gaps in health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. But let me just outline a few. It is completely unacceptable in this country that if you are an Indigenous person, your life expectancy is about a decade shorter than for non-Indigenous Canadians. Rates of diabetes are about three times the national average, and you know how high the national average is. When it comes to infectious diseases, in First Nations, the rates of tuberculosis are 33 times that of non-Indigenous Canadians. And for Inuit, the rates of tuberculosis are 375 times higher than for non-Indigenous Canadians. These inequities are shameful, but they're not inexplicable. The lack of education, crowded housing, high unemployment rates, incarceration rates, 
All of these contribute in one way or another to poor health. I believe our government has taken some important steps. You may be aware that we've committed to more than $8 billion to begin some of the work of rebuilding Canada's relationship with its Indigenous peoples. And among other things, it will go to some of those things I've outlined, like better housing, clean water, early childhood education. But as we move ahead with the new health accord, we need to find a way to bring Indigenous voices to the table. Instead of the status quo, where we respond to crises in Indigenous communities as they arise, I am determined to work with Indigenous leaders and other stakeholders to build an approach to these health gaps that is proactive, effective, and just. And that, that brings me to my final point in terms of the areas that we're going to talk about in the health court, and that is innovating in how we deliver services. So far, I've talked about specific care uh, areas within the healthcare system that need attention. But the reality is, and some of you know this, that dysfunction and inefficiency are deeply embedded in our systems. Fixing this requires innovation. And when I talk about innovation, I'm not talking just about shiny new toys. But I'm talking about adapting new business models and figuring out how we can deliver better care and better outcomes for lower costs. Large enterprises, public or private, can't thrive without innovation, and healthcare is no exception. People like Dr. Sinclair know this all too well. He was the founding chair and the acting CEO of Canada Health InfoWay, which works to implement digital innovations to support uh, health for Canadians. It's time for us to, to work together to reclaim the political will and the time and resources to develop and implement bold reforms in the funding and the organization of front, frontline delivery. It's not easy, certainly, but many other countries are doing it. Americans have actually been some of the ones who have kick-started the development of a whole new suite of models to change the way health services are funded and delivered accountable care organizations, primary care medical homes, and bundled patients. Now, before anybody jumps on me, I'm not talking about privatizing Canadian health care. I'm not talking about how health care is paid for. I'm talking about how it can be more efficiently and effectively delivered and what those models of care are. It's about reorganizing health care in ways that are efficient and that put the patient first but still maintaining our single-payer public model. Indeed, some of the boldest reforms in the United States are taking place within the U.S. Medicare and Medicaid programs that are public programs. If we want to modernize healthcare systems and improve performance, we need to strengthen underlying infrastructure, including digital health. And despite billions of dollars that have been invested both federally and provincially in e-health over the past 15 years, I don't need to tell you that huge gaps remain. We have adopted a dizzying array of information systems across the health sector, but sadly, they rarely communicate with one another. It's shocking to all of us that in the age of Facebook and e-commerce, people are still using fax machines in most doctor's offices, and most Canadians can't go online for health records. Let me actually test the system. I suspect most of you in the room have a smartphone in your pocket or in your purse. How many of you, somebody just handed me a wonderful health policy book over there. How many of you could go, if, if you have Wi-Fi in here, do you have Wi-Fi in here? Okay, if you had data access, could you go on your, and you were to pause, I was to stop talking, could you go online in the next few minutes and order yourself your favorite health policy book from your smartphone? Most of you can do that? Okay. How many of you can go online using that same smartphone and book a doctor's appointment? Anybody? One or two? Okay, not very many. Okay. How many of you, if you could, um, if you had money in the bank, could go online using your smartphone right now, go into your banking system and transfer money from one account to another? Pretty much everybody in the room. And those of you who didn't put your hand up just haven't figured out how to do it. But because <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> I don't think you can have a bank account in Canada anymore and not be able to, to do it, transfer money from your smartphone. 
But how many of you can go online right now and if you, assuming you had a blood test in the last 10 years, could go online and actually find the results of your most recent blood test? A few, that's not bad. Okay, I'm seeing, okay, this is good. We're making some progress. What it speaks to me of, though, is that in every other part of our life, we've made the transition effectively. But we need to focus on building digital systems that actually focus on patients, where we can seamlessly integrate care across the delivery mechanisms. So if I believe that some of our future federal investment has to prioritize making these connections for patients and service providers and institutions, making sure that can that patients can access health data electronically, can book appointments, can consult their physicians without having to visit an office. Our slow progress on e-health also means that we haven't developed the kind of data systems that we need for public health surveillance, um, which I'm asked about all the time. How come we don't know how many people have died of overdose uh, in the last year in Canada? Nor have we found ways to be able to measure improvements, make course corrections, and close gaps as effectively as we could. In healthcare, it's true that technology raises costs. New tests and diagnostic tools are adopted into practice. Again, we have the challenge that there's often not a, a robust assessment of cost effectiveness in the adaptation of new technologies. And when productivity improves with new technology, we haven't found that our systems for remuner remunerating providers keeps pace. So there are some real challenges in terms of sustainable ways to be able to manage technology in healthcare. And certainly we need to be able to reward providers for doing what's in the best interest of patients. And if it's in the best interest of patients to manage them remotely, then that's what we should do. The good news is that innovation is an area where there is absolute consensus for action, where federal government can play a role, we can help to drive the adoption of better business models and we can accelerate change. So targeted federal funding in, for example, pan-Canadian organizations have already paid uh, dividends in spreading innovation and in supporting digital health and reporting on performance and in evaluating health technologies. I think this is again an opportunity to seize uh, the new, the fact that we're in, in the discussions around a new health accord and build in a commitment to build on this strong foundation. So almost time to wrap up, but no discussion on healthcare in Canada is complete without discussing, of course, the money. Some insist that the problem facing Canadian Medicare is lack of money. And they decry the fact that future growth rate of the Canada Health Transfer will be brought more in line with the growth rate of our economy. But the facts simply don't support the notion that what our health care system needs most of all is even more cash. Canada is in fact one of the highest spenders on health care, and yet it doesn't always achieve the kind of results that Canadians need and deserve. And health accords of the past have, for all the hard work and good intention involved, have not always tackled the fundamental structural reforms. We took the status quo and we inflated it. So as I said to the Canadian Medical Association recently, I'm convinced that we have an obligation as a government of Canada, for example, to do more than simply open up the federal wallet. Healthcare has never in this country been solely the responsibility of any one level of government. Every province and territory on its own, I know, has been advancing very important reforms across the past decade, and I commend their resolve on this, their creativity in adapting their healthcare systems to the new realities of aging populations, for example. But the Government of Canada also has interests at stake in the debate over the future of healthcare. We are unique among jurisdictions, but we have a solemn duty to ensure that investments that we make in healthcare contribute to the equitable treatment of all Canadians. There's a national interest in ensuring that comparable services are available across Canada, that universal health coverage is portable and comprehensive, and that we can safely share information that's in the public's best interest. If we don't have a say in how health funds are spent, then signing up to increase spending would amount to assuming an open-ended liability. The Government of Canada is coming to the table ready to invest federal dollars in ways that will advance the transformation of care. We've already committed to an additional $3 billion to help with home care, for instance. 
ensure we have to ensure that that new money doesn't simply inflate health systems, but actually puts health care on the road to long-term sustainability. Our commitment to that new funding is ironclad, but I'm going to seek agreement with my colleagues in the provinces and territories on how we can make sure that new dollars that are invested will achieve real results for Canadians. Canadians are proud of their health care systems, but we've taken them for granted. We haven't recognized that they've gradually become eroded and fragmented. We have to reclaim the vision that the founders of Medicare intended for health care in our country. This year is a unique opportunity for us to bring real change to health care. It's an opportunity that we can't miss. If Canada is to sustain the cherished, publicly funded and universally accessible healthcare systems that we have long relied on, we need to adapt to new ideas and renew our approach to health policy. We have an opportunity to shape the future of publicly funded healthcare in Canada to make it more responsive to the needs and expectations of Canadians. This is going to require the participation of all stakeholders, the federal government, provincial and territorial governments, healthcare providers, policy advisors, all of you in this room are essential in the discussion so that Canada will be a world leader in supporting the health of its people. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you all. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Michael Green to make some closing remarks and to formally thank you. So thank you. So thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Minister Philbo. I think everyone would agree it was worth the wait in the lobby <laughs> at the beginning. I know. So I'd like to, uh, as the director of the Center for Health Services and Policy Search, when I saw your five priority slides, and I think of the work that I know that researchers at Queens are doing, and I see those topics: home care, mental health, Indigenous health. Uh, primary care, innovation in models, e-health. I think of all the great work that our faculty are doing and how they might be able to help contribute to some of the innovation agenda. I thank you very much for coming. And um, our Dean Richard Resnick couldn't be here today, but on uh, his behalf, on behalf of the School of Policy Studies, Faculty of Health Sciences, and Center for Health Services and Policy Research, since you are a Western grad, and we know that homecoming is a great tradition at all of our uh, schools, we have some Queen's paraphernalia for your next yeah. homecoming. Thank you.